It's the weekend and you have financial questions that need answering. That can only mean one thing. It's time for Jill on Money, the show that takes the mystery out of your finances. Here's your host, Jill Schlesinger. Welcome to Jill on Money. We are delighted that you're spending time with us this weekend. We are recording live from the Capital One Bank Studios in New York. Thanks to our one of our sponsors, Capital One, for naming our studio the Capital One Bank Studios. This is the show that takes the mystery out of your financial life. We are not going to lecture you about what you should be doing with your personal financial life. We're going to help coach you. Even though some of you even do the funniest things, like ask us how much to spend on a ring when you are proposing, which brings up a great topic to begin the program. We have wonderful news to report from the Jill on Money program. Mark, executive producer extraordinaire, is now engaged. What percentage of your um, income did you spend on your ring? It was already set aside. You see, this man is so good that he had set aside the money necessary It's an exciting time here. Uh, There have been no big plans for a big party yet. But he's shaking his head. Mark's not the kind of guy who likes being the center of attention. So anyway, when you send an email with your email to this address, askjill at jillonmoney.com, when you've got your financial questions that are lined up, don't forget to congratulate Mark and, uh, and send your best wishes. In fact, I have to say that one of our callers was helpful in securing the ring. So how about that? Somebody who had called and asked advice and said Mark then followed up with this person. And she was the one who kind of turned you on to the diamond dude, right? So exciting. So once again, the community is working. If you want to get deeper into our community here at Jill on Money... Just hop onto the website, jillonmoney.com, and sign up for our free weekly newsletter. Okay, let's take a call. We're starting with Aaron from Salt Lake City on the line. Hello, Aaron. How are you? Hi, Jill. I'm good. Thanks. Thanks for taking my call. Oh, I'm so happy to chat with you. Tell me what is going on and how we can help you out. So my question is more about savings prioritization. Mm-hmm. Um, my husband and I are saving up for a house. And I just became eligible for my company's 401k plan. He's been eligible for his for a while now. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'm just wondering what our priority should be. Is it house savings or maxing out my 401k? Tell me about what's going on in general. So you said you're married. How old are you guys? I'm 27. He's 32. Is he contributing to his retirement account? Yeah, we max his out every year and we've been maxing out our IRAs every year as well. So he's putting in last year 18,000, 18,500 this year or maxing out to the match. Putting in the 185. Okay, so he's 185 and then you're each putting in 5500 to your Roths, which is great. That's right. How much do you guys make together? Combined it's about 215. Okay, fantastic. How big a house are you going to buy? In other words, how much are you going to spend on a house? Um, that is variable. Um, <laughs> we, we're hoping for something in like the $350,000 range. But if we can't get what we want for that, maybe we go a little higher, maybe up to like four twenty five. Oh, look at you. It's always the creeping up, isn't it? All right. So you need to save eighty or 90000 bucks. let's just say. Uh, right. How much have you saved so far for the house down payment? So right now we're sitting right around 30, 35. Okay. Presumably you want to save up for the 20% down to get the best possible mortgage rate, right? Right. Although maybe this is a bad idea, but we wouldn't mind, I guess, paying for PMI. You mean in the short term? Yeah. I I, I would think about that. I, I understand what you mean. Are you guys both in stable careers? Yes. I don't foresee any real changes unless I decide to take some time off um, to raise kids. But that You're not, not allowed to take time off if we're going to go through this whole plan. I'm totally kidding. You can do whatever okay, you don't. want. I promise. Uh, all right. So 
how much are you putting into the house down payment fund right now? I don't know, probably like five, three to five grand a month. Mm -hmm. You said you just are eligible for your own retirement plan. Have you elected to do anything yet? Yeah, I elected to get in up to the match. They'll match 4%. Okay. So I did that so that we can at least take advantage of that, but I could always jump it up a little bit if we want to. How much money is in your husband's 401k right now? He has like 67. And how much is in your Roth IRA? Each of your Roth IRAs or combine them. It's fine with me. So mine's about 20 and his is about 17. Okay. A few things. I mean, you really, you really want to buy this house, right? That is that when you're saying your priorities, you're saying you really want to buy. That's your number one priority. I think so. I mean, do you guys have kids yet or not? Yeah, we have two little kids. Okay. Um, I mean, if, since that's your priority, I would start shifting a little bit more money into the house down payment fund. So, I mean, you've you've done a really good job of putting money away. You could, you know, divert instead of saying I'm going to put eighteen five into your husband's four hundred one k this year. You can pull it back a little bit and say, hey, you know what? Let me let me put in half of that and put the rest in the house down payment fund. If you want to get into a house and that is your priority, then let's make that your priority. In some combination here, we're trying to free up the money to get your house down payment fund up to what is likely to be your real down payment of close to 85000 or not. I, I don't feel bad about giving you that advice. I know it seems very contrary to say lighten up on your retirement contributions at a time um, when I'm trying to yell at people for like, please, or put, put money into retirement, start as early as you can. You've done a very good job. But if we're going to pay for that house, I really don't like PMI. And it's it's sort of a this extra cost that there's no real reason to have because you guys seem to have the cash flow to save up to actually get that down payment. That said, if you had to and you found the house of your dreams or not such a dream, but you found the right house, you could put less money down and then really work hard to wipe out the PMI as soon as you, you get it. Ideally, we'd want the 20 down, you lighten up on the retirement contributions, then crank it back up as soon as you got the house fund all set. Gotcha. Are you comfortable with the way you're investing the money right now in the retirement accounts? Is, are you guys very aggressive? Or where are you right now? I mean, I think it's pretty aggressive. We're at like 80, 90 percent stocks. Mm -hmm. I think they're just in target date funds for the most part. All right. That's fine. The, the most important thing is whatever that house fund is invested in is safe. So really boring yeah. on that part of it. Keep doing what you're doing. It sounds like you're in good shape. Save a little bit more money for that house down payment and send us a picture of the house when you buy it, okay? <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much. Joe. All right. Take care. We'll get back to more of your great financial questions in just a minute. Hey, you know what? Uh, go to Jill I'm on, um, bleh, Go to JillOnMoney.com, click on the book tab, and guess what? You'll be able to pre-order my new book. It's not coming out till next year, but I want pre-orders. I'm not sure why, but I'm supposed to ask for them. The Dumb Things Smart People Do With Their Money is available for pre-order right now. Go to JillOnMoney.com and just uh, tap on the book section. We'll be right back. Do I invest here? Should I put my money there? Jill Schlesinger can help you. Back to Jill on Money. You're back with Jill on Money. Ah, it's so much fun to be with you guys. So many things going on in my life. It's so crazy. But when I'm really focused and I feel, yeah, I just feel like so awesome hanging with you so great so it's all good uh big travel week for me domestically up and down the eastern seaboard reminded me once again that travel just not easy just not easy i'm sorry uh yeah i wish i had a bullet train it's amazing how bad our infrastructure is especially those of us who live in the uh new, greater new york area where the three airports suck so badly 
It's not even funny. But that said, I'm a huge fan of the Amtrak services. So thank you so much to our pals at Amtrak and the Acela Express specifically. You are listening to the program that tries to take the mystery out of your financial life. But the way we do that is if you send us an email and let us know what's going on. Send that email to askjill at jillonmoney.com. That's what Joe in Chicago did. Tell me what's going on and how we can help you out. Um, so my big question is um, I'm thinking about paying off my mortgage, and this is kind of the, the situation. My in-laws have a second home, and they're probably going to be selling it in about three years. And this has been a home that we've gone to, my wife and I, for you know, 10 years, and uh, we've got little kids that have gone to the house. So it has like, you know, a big emotional attachment to it. Mm -hmm. So my thought is, you know, should I um, pay off my house in the next three years so that I'm ready to to buy that house? And, you know, the thing in order to pay that off, I'd have to stop contributing to um, my Roth 403B, which I have been contributing to, but I'm still contributing fully to my Roth IRA, and I've got some other you know, accounts that are they're pretty sizable right now. Um, also a teacher, so thinking about retirement, there's going to be a pension for me um, down the line between, you know, age 55 and 60. Okay. So let me get a few of the, the basics in here. Say so you're married. You got some kids? Yes, two kids, eight and five. Okay. And are both you and your wife working or just you? Um, I work and she works part time. So our, our salary together is probably about 145000 a year. Okay. So you said you're putting money into a Roth IRA, but also your Roth 403B, right? Yes. And how much are you contributing right now into each of those? So um, I max out a Roth IRA for myself, and my wife also maxes out her Roth IRA, so 5500 yep. a piece. Um, and then we were doing um, 700 a month in the Roth 403B. Okay. And when you were doing that, you were feeling okay in terms of you could put money in there, you could pay your mortgage, you could live your life, your bills are covered. Like you felt good? Yes, okay. absolutely. Great. And uh, when you think about this second home, what is the idea here? Is this a second home where, you know, you're just going to hang out, it's a vacation home? Is your plan to buy it with a traditional mortgage? Um, the plan was to that house. You know, my house right now is worth about you know three hundred thousand dollars. That house is probably worth about one hundred and seventy-five thousand. So, if I paid off my mortgage, we would we were going to basically refinance the house I have at home to avoid any like PMI or anything like that. And mm -hmm. yes, use a traditional mortgage, probably like a fifteen-year mortgage at the time. Okay, but I don't understand why you have to pay off the house to do this. In other words, why would you have to pay the house off now to do it? Well, I was thinking, so I owe about 110000 on the house now, mm -hmm. um, and if, you know, I just paid that regularly off, maybe that would only be down to sixty or 70000 and then if I was to buy the house, I would have to roll all those things together. So just trying to keep, you know, the monthly costs where it's not an overwhelming issue of, you know, oh my gosh, there's the, the mortgage is too big on this, on this second home, essentially. What's the rate on your current mortgage? 3.5%. Uh, mm, I like that rate. That is a darn good rate. I, I don't know if this makes sense. I don't know why you'd pay down the mortgage. Here's th Just go with me here for a second. Okay. You're putting money away. That's great. How much money do you have in, let's call it your emergency reserve? Not for this potential house purchase, but just like safe money. What do you got? Um, about $30,000. Okay, good. Total retirement, about how much in retirement accounts? Um, about three hundred thousand dollars. Oh, very good, excellent. That's great. And then, and then we have another about one hundred and thirty-five thousand in the stock market right now. Just to what? What? Oh, oh, excuse me. That's like calling burying the lead. What is that invested in? Um, various blue chip stocks: 3M, Johnson Johnson, John Deere, AT and T, GE. Okay. Um, you know what I'm going to say, don't you? you I don't know. know. Yeah. Okay. Here we go. It strikes me as interesting that you have $135,000 that's sitting in stocks when you're talking about borrowing money and paying money down and having a cheap loan when you actually have the money to almost buy this house outright right now in the stock yeah. market, okay? Now, I know that one thirty-five isn't all yours. You owe capital gains on it. I get it. But right. what I would be thinking about is this. I think that is really the money you use 
to buy the second home. It doesn't mean okay. you have to buy it in cash, but if you consider this, I feel right. like you're you're silly not to maintain that three and a half percent mortgage. It's cheap, and I think that you could use the money, even if you just said, I'm gonna put fifty grand of my stock portfolio down and finance the rest, or maybe you're gonna put more down. I don't know. But I have to say that I don't see why you wouldn't tap the money that you already have that's set aside and just reallocate it to buying the second home. I think that, you know, it, for someone in your situation to have individual stocks, it's been great. I don't want to go back. I'm not going to go back and recreate and say, like, gosh, you would have been just fine owning the index. Who cares? You got this money. In fact, I'm almost like inclined to say, why don't you buy the house right now? Give uh-huh. your, and I'm serious. I'm, I'm like literally thinking this right now. Like I would start selling off some of the stock a little bit at a time pay the tax along the way, have the money available. Tell me about the in-laws. Are they in good financial shape or not? Yeah, no, they're they're in great financial shape. It's just a matter of them, you know, they're almost 70 years old and, and you know, making the drive and putting a boat in the water and cutting the grass is kind of, you know, just getting a little bit too much for them. Well, how about this? How about you give them a down payment on the house right now and they don't have to sell it to you right now? And how about you don't even get a mortgage? You just end up essentially saying, let them hold the paper, hold the mortgage note for you. And then you don't even have to go through a bank and go through that cost. What do you think of that? Yeah, that's actually a pretty good idea. I think that could be, you could do an intra-family loan. It kind of works beautifully. You have to go talk to a lawyer because I I would want it papered. Is your wife one of many children? Um, She has one brother. All right. So we don't want to shut him out. Is he going to be part of this buying the house or not? No, it it would just be on ours. All right. So presumably there's a couple of ways to skin this one. And one is that you, you you buy the house now, you say to your, your in-laws, hey, look, here's a down payment right now. Here's some money. We want to, you know, create this pathway to doing this. And then you can put down some portion of that stock portfolio, maybe half of it or whatever, and then they hold the paper. They hold the mortgage and you'll start making payments to them. Or, by the way, you can buy the house right now and then they can pay you rent for staying in it. So there are a lot of different ways, but I would see a lawyer and definitely say, we want to try to figure out we're going to buy this home. We want to be able to do an intra-family loan so that, you know, we're not paying the bank interest. We're just telling, paying my in-laws interest. And we want to come up with a good game plan so that they can stay in the house as long as they want. But then it reverts to us. I think there's like a great idea here and, and you need some help doing it. But I think it would make so much sense for both sides. Okay. Yeah, that does make sense. And then and then just continue on with the other money that I was going to pay off extra in the, the Roth Borrow 3B? Yes. And I want you, that's the other piece of this, which is you're doing such a great job. I'd hate for you to divert your attention right now and say, I'm going to pay off a three and a half percent note when I'm putting money away and saving like crazy in the Roth IRA and the Roth 403B. So I would absolutely positively keep funding that and doing the best you can to max it out. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you for the info. All right, we'll get back to more of your questions when we return during the break. Why don't you uh, head over to the Jill on Money website? You can read all the stuff that we've been writing and see some of the uh, great videos that we post. Check it out, JillOnMoney.com. We'll be right back. Have a finance question? There are many ways to reach the show. You can call anytime at 855-411-JILL, send an email to askjill at jillonmoney.com, or tweet a question on Twitter using the handle at jillonmoney. Just use the hashtag AskJill. You're back with Jill on Money live from the Capital One Bank Studios. They really, I'm only supposed to say it once every hour. I'm saying it more than that because I like saying it. It makes me feel like big time. All right. I have no relationship with this. You know, I just read it, right? There's a whole sales team. I can get involved in this. Um, If you'd like to get on the program, why don't you drop us a note? Send an email to askjill at jillonmoney.com. And by the way, go to the website, jillonmoney.com. Sign up for our free weekly newsletter. You are going to be amply rewarded when you do. 
because you're going to get some offers to like get a sneak peek at my book. It's happening. How many people, Mark? Oh, all right. Not bad. So you've doubled what you thought you wanted by the end of the year. You you really set the bar so low. Yeah, well, I it it I love I love the fact that people want some information. This is just a quick way to get a wrap up of the week. Hey, you know what I did this morning at uh, three o'clock when I was up too early because my dog got sick in the middle of the night? I woke I wrote something for you and I realized that I didn't need to. It was like a superfluous pl- post, but I'm going to give it I'm going to send it to you anyway to put it up because uh, that's the kind of gal I am. Anyway, here we go. Let's do some emails. Eduardo loves the show. He works for an airline and that airline froze pensions in 2003. The union took over, started a second pension and funded it for four years. Then the company voted the union out. To collect from the first pension, I have to retire from the company. Right. I can now collect from the second pension while I'm working at my age, which is 58. Here are the options. I can get a lump sum at age 58, 2800 bucks, and 160 for life. Oh, 160 a month for life. Or 62, 3300, 180. Or I can collect 335 a month for four years and at the age of 62 collect 60 for life. No, that doesn't. That's not the right one. Let me just do quick math here, little math head brain. Um, okay. I don't know how long you plan to work. That's my general inclination is that if you can, I would wait till 62. That looks like the better deal. I'm just doing some quick numbers here. But I think that works best. You know what you should do? You should uh, go talk to your, I was going to say union rep, but maybe you don't. Um Hmm. <laughs> you know what? I don't know what else is going on in your financial life. So I presume that if you're still working, that's fine. Um, but if you're looking about re- for retirement planning, then maybe what you ought to do actually is to go talk to somebody and seek like the advice of a fee only planner or a, a CFP. So you can go to NAPFA, N A P, Peter, N A P. FA.org. You can go to the CFP website, uh, let's make a plan.org. You can noodle around. I think that's what I would do. Uh, here's someone who wrote us um, and who says that she's a huge fan of the show. I love personal finance because it eases any anxiety I have about my future. I'm wondering if you have content on voluntary benefits accident, cancer, disability, critical illness, hospital confinement. I'm working with companies um, out there. I'm trying to decide if I think buying cancer or critical illness insurance is worth the money, both pre-tax, or should I use those premium dollars to fund my HSA? I have the answer to you, for you. Um, This is easy. Usually those cancer critical illness insurance plans are not worth the money. So I think you would be better off to use your premium dollars to fund your HSA. That would be, I think, a much better plan. Um, And there's a lot going on. She's 29. She's single. She makes 70 grand a year. She's got 20 grand in her emergency fund. She owns a home. She's got money in her 401k. She's got a Roth IRA. And she's got a high deductible health insurance plan. So I would definitely make it the HSA. She's got no student debt. She's got a full ride to school and work throughout. Anyway, don't, I would not buy that. Here's what I think. If you got voluntary benefits, no on accident, no on cancer, yes on disability, no on critical illness, no on hospital confinement, that's it. The only one I'm interested in would be disability. And and frankly, you might be covered already through your through your employer, you might have a baseline of disability insurance. And the only way I would look at buying disability insurance, if you were the type of person who might go into um, be, become self-employed, and if that is a portable policy, meaning you can bring it with you wherever you go, then yeah, why not? But otherwise, no. 
Here's a uh, question from T. Um, what should I do with a with two variable universal life insurance policies with death benefits of hundred thousand dollars each and a cash value of forty five grand after forty five grand after thirty years of by the way guys punctuation totally helps me read this a lot more easily but I'm gonna just <laughs> I'm a stickler I hate to say it. After 30 years of ownership, uh, the original insurance is not needed. We're 65, 66. We've got resources. We don't need us. We have long-term care. Should we cash it out, take a loan? We're thinking of cashing it out. Um, I would, so two choices. I would find out, first of all, if you cash it out, is there a tax hit? So if there is and it's small, then yeah, go ahead and cash it out. If it's a big tax hit, and you got to find this out, then you could take a loan against the policy. Um, but I'm I lean towards cashing it out. Get a little bit more information. Find out what the li- tax liability is. Okay. <sighs> How much time? That's it. I'm done. All right. I'll do this. Uh, uh, hmm, 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 hmm. Okay. I'll have to do this when we come back. All right. So, no, I think I can do it. 87 years old. Social Security is income. Small IRA. Um, She's got a reverse mortgage. Um, Can I specify in my will that the condo should be left to the holder of the reverse mortgage? I don't think you need to. Ask your lawyer about this. She wants to leave the balance of her IRA to her daughter? No problem. You can do that by beneficiary. You don't have to name that in your will. Talk to the lawyer about the reverse mortgage question. Whoever helped you with that. Okay. Whew. Good. Did it. Jill on Money. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com is our email address. Our website is called jillonmoney.com. We'll be right back. Follow Jill on Twitter and Instagram for more personal finance content. Just use the handle at Jill on Money. Now, back to the show. You know what I need to do? Hey, you're back with Jill on Money. I need to trade financial advice for a new hip. Anyone can do that? Can someone do that? My hips are killing me. Oh. Anyway, I digress. It's too much. You know, I stopped running because of this. Now, even just walking is not good. Anyway, you're listening to Jill on Money. This is the program where I fetch about my hips and also answer your financial questions. And the easiest way for us to answer your questions is not to guess what those questions are, but for you to actually contact us, send an email, askjill at jillonmoney.com. Askjill at jillonmoney.com. Very easy. Uh, And often we'll talk about different things going on here at the show. You can always go to the website, jillonmoney.com, get some info. All right. Paul writes, I love the show. And the great advice you always give to your listeners. I have a question that I hope you can help me with. I'm 29 years old. How about that? Last year, purchased my first home at age 29. My financial situation at the time was that I was making a lot more than my expenses and saving money but not investing. As a result, I had enough money saved up for a 20% down payment on a house that I love. However, I was not paying attention to my financial health as well as I should have been. So I got a higher interest rate than I wanted, which could cost me and will cost me a lot more money over the next 30 years. To be clear, I was never financially irresponsible. I missed no payments. I have no debt. It's just I wasn't investing or building my credit. Aha. I only got my first credit card a few months before the home purchase, which leads me to my question. I've spent the last year working hard on my financial health. I've increased my credit score from the mid-600s to the mid-700s. I started investing in my Roth and my individual brokerage account. I've set aside savings goals for retirement. I would like to lower my mortgage payments so that less money can go to paying interest on the mortgage and more money can go into saving and investing. Do you think it's too early to refinance? I'm only a year into my mortgage. Are there pros and cons to refinancing earlier, later, or not at all? Will shopping for a new loan have a significant negative impact on my credit? What should I look for when trying to navigate the home lending market? And how do I select a lender? Two more relevant facts. My mortgage has no prepayment penalty. 
And I plan on owning the house forever, but converting it to a rental property in a few years. Any help you could give would be appreciated. Well, I mean, look, you got to go and at least figure out what is going on in the marketplace at large. So what I would do is this. I would contact a couple of mortgage lenders, including your own, the one that holds your mortgage right now. And I would explain the situation. Hey, you got this note. My score has improved. If I were to refinance, can you give me a low fee refinancing that would lower my payment? And I think that, you know, by simply giving telling your story, you may find out that actually it not the, the, the refinancing may not be worth it because it may be that your your actual mortgage rate drops by some small number. Maybe it's an eighth of a point. Maybe it's a quarter of a point. But you should find out. Don't go and run the whole credit report because that will actually, that could be a problem. But I would start asking. I don't think that, I don't think that having your credit score go from the mid sixes to the mid sevens is going to amount to a very big change, but I could be wrong. So check that out. And the other piece of this is that if you are converting it to a rental property in a few years, um, you, it, the, the time to actually refinance the mortgage would be now, not once it's a rental property, because rental properties tend to have different, somewhat higher rates associated with it. So maybe, maybe someone will say, hey, you know what, if you got to the mid eight, if you got to uh, 800, that would be the time to do it. But I don't know enough about the differential between the 100 points on your credit score to, fi- to know whether or not it makes sense. So good luck. Let us know how it turns out, and uh, we'll go for there. How about that? Uh, Rudy wants to know what kind of an account to open for a baby. Bond stocks, mutual fund savings, love your show. Rudy, the way that um, I think about it is do you want it to be for college or high school, private high school, or just a slush fund account? Um, the The easiest way to do it is to kind of wait and see um, and like what the parents really need. But you may want to just open some 529 accounts where you're the owner, the kids are the beneficiaries, and it's uh, very easy to do. I wouldn't do any savings bonds, kind of paying pretty rotten interest rates still. Um, So give that a shot. Let us know if that that works out for you. And um, nice gesture, Grandpa, right? People are very nice, so nice to their family. It's a good thing. All right. When we return, we are going to answer more of your questions. Mark is diligently trying to get me to go through all of the emails. The summer emails piled up because I was away in August. And so you know what happens. Then it all goes kaflooey. So uh, if you've got a financial question, don't hesitate. Send us an email. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. That's Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. And... Uh, you know, you get a little bounce back email that says, we love you. We want to help you. It's all good. And then hopefully we can get you on the air or we'll read your email on the air if it represents a, a number of other people. Sometimes if it's really narrow in focus, I might just answer it, but not read it on the air. Don't be, don't take offense to that, please. You know, and we do the best we can. Just wanted to have some applicability to everybody. All right. So uh, send an email, ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. When we return, more of your questions. We'll be right back. You're back with Jill on Money. If you've got a financial question, we'd love to hear from you. Our email address here is askjill at jillonmoney.com. Hey, you know what? We got all sorts of cool stuff on the website at jillonmoney.com, the website. There is uh, good stuff, all my old segments that are up there, my CFP tips of the week, stuff we write, old shows, resources. All sorts of cool resources that we have. Um, The newsletter, you can sign up and get our free weekly newsletter. All that. You can even just go there and if you can't remember the email address, just go to jillonmoney.com and just contact us. You complete the form and we get it. It's pretty good. 
Okay. Um, Will writes that he's he and his wife are 66. They've got a total retirement income about 78,600 bucks. They've got about another 25 grand in an annuity that will be uh, due in 2020. Um, their problem is they don't have a lot of money in investments or in cash. They've got uh, 4,000 bucks in an IRA. They've got he started a new job this month, a couple grand a month from that. But basically, his three big assets are three pieces of property. A vacation home worth $399,000 with no mortgage. A primary residence with a mortgage of $200,000. And a new investment income townhouse with a mortgage of $266,000. He says, I don't feel overstretched, but uh, razor thin on income. I'm banking on the security of the real estate investments. Should I liquidate two or three of these homes or hang on? Well, why do two or three? Let's start with one. Um, so let's start with this. Uh, if the new investment townhouse, I, if it's brand new, you may not want to sell it since you just got it. Um, so maybe it's about the vacation home or the mortgage, I mean, or the primary. Could you live in the vacation home? What's happening with it? You got to free up some cash one way or the other. You got too much money in real estate. You're over allocated. I'm not exactly sure how much more money you need, but if it's $2,000 a month in addition to that almost $80,000, if you free up some of the money from these real estate investments, I think you're going to be fine. But uh, I'm nervous about you having pretty much all of your net worth in real estate. Okay. Good luck. That's it. That's for hour one. We love hearing from you, so keep the emails coming. It's askjill at jillonmoney.com. We will be right back. It's the weekend, and that can only mean one thing. You're listening to Jill on Money, the show that takes the mystery out of your finances. Here's your host, Jill Schlesinger. You are back with Jill on Money. It's the second hour. We are live from the Capital One Bank studios here on the far west side of New York. And, uh, you know, guys, I am a student of history. I love history. And 10 years ago, this weekend, you know what happened? The House of Representatives killed or voted down a $700 billion rescue plan, also known as TARP. And on that day that they voted that down, the Dow Jones Industrial Average fell 778 points. That was a 7% one-day move. Just to put that in perspective, that would be as if the Dow fell about 1,850 points in one session today. And who else is a student of history? Our guest, Gretchen Morganson, who is a senior special writer in the investigations unit at the Wall Street Journal. She used to work at the New York Times. She uh, won a Pulitzer Prize back in 2002. Get ready. We're going back in time and reliving the financial crisis with Gretchen Morganson. Tell us what was going on for you more than 10 years ago, Um, what you were covering, because you, you had a column in the New York Times. So what were you covering at the sort of in the... 2006-7 2006-7 era. What was going on for you? Well, we were covering, of course, the real estate bubble. We were watching that. Um, what I was really interested in was the behind-the-scenes stuff that was going on, the stuff that you really couldn't see on the surface. And this was really the introduction that I gave to the New York Times readers of derivatives and the roles that they would play. Now, derivatives are called derivatives because what they are, they are instruments, securities that are derived, their value value is derived from some other underlying security, like a stock has an option that is derived from it. So whatever the stock does, the option will move similarly, okay? So the derivatives were hidden from view. These were derivatives that were um, based on the housing market, based on residential mortgages, and they were derivatives that essentially leveraged or or expanded the market for home mortgages. So 
when you had, let's say, a million-dollar mortgage, there were derivatives that could really make that into two million, three million position. So it was a way for people to gamble. It was a way for people to increase their exposure to this market. And it really was not well understood. And so I started hearing about, you know, you should really look at these collateralized debt obligations, which were pools of mortgages that had been put together into one entity and sliced up based on risk, um, based on how risky the borrower was, based on the property value. And so people were saying, you know, you really ought to look at this because this is really amplifying the bubble. So the thing that's interesting about derivatives is that I always feel like they got a bad rap after the financial crisis because the idea of a derivative began as a way to mitigate risk a million years ago when I got into the business. Like, hey, we're using options, calls, and puts. We're using this as a way to say, I've got a position. I want to protect myself if something really bad or unexpected were to occur. But what happened was everybody was all in on this notion that real estate prices never go down. And what's fascinating about that as the central premise for this is that what we were meant to believe was that this was based on hardcore data. And because there had never been a massive slide in real estate values for 40 or 50 years since the Depression, presumably, uh, then we could now extrapolate that experience forward as if it could never happen again. Correct. And so that was our black swan event. So when you were covering this, what was the part that was shocking to you in real time? What did you find sort of like, wow, like, so, I mean, mortgage-backed securities have been around for a while. So what was it? Was it the the risk level, the amplification, the fact that it was hidden from sight? What part of it was like, holy smokes, this is what's going on? Well, I think it was a lot. It was several different things. First of all, it was the idea that you would give a mortgage to a person who maybe didn't even have a pulse, okay? And anything goes lending. And so what became very clear was that because the... Um, you know, idea of pooling these mortgages together. Um, It was an assembly line, essentially, uh, a Wall Street assembly line. So they would take the mortgages that were, you know, underwritten by a bank or by a um, countrywide financial, which was not a bank, it was a lender. They would take them, pool them, they would cut them up, they would sell them to their clients. So all along the way there, there was no um, sort of policing mechanism. It was all about getting the fee to do the next step in the process. And so there was there was sort of no um, mechanism for somebody asking the question, should we really make this mortgage? Because there was so much money at stake to make the mortgage, to sell the mortgage, and then for Wall Street to sell that pool of mortgages to investors who were really eager for yield, that there was no check and balance along the way. So it was an assembly line where there were people that didn't have any skin in the game. They did not have any, um, you know, real duty or obligation to say, wait a minute, should we be making this mortgage? Should this mortgage actually go into this pool? Is it really safe or is it too risky? And is what we are advertising as safe really safe? And I feel like at that moment, that was when they all said, well, there are these companies that do ratings and (laughs) they say that they're safe. So, you know, mm-hmm. uh, Bank of Luxembourg, you now can buy this because Moody's AAA. or AAA and it's stamped on there. So what was the credit agency part of that? Huge, huge. You put your finger right on it. So there was supposed to be a policing mechanism called the credit rating agencies who were supposed to go into each pool and analyze the mortgages and say, you know, this has this risk level, risk of default is essentially what they're looking at, risk of non-payment. And so the credit rating agencies were just slapping triple A's all over these securities that really had no business being anything like a triple A. And so everyone had a comfort level because traditionally the credit rating agencies had been pretty careful. Full, um, analyzing corporate debt. That was their main thing, or sovereign wealth debt, sovereign debt. So all of a sudden, they're rubber stamping these securities that are very complex that carry thousands of mortgages, and they weren't really looking at the loans, loan by loan. Is it your understanding that the reason that that happened was that the credit rating agencies were either trying to win the business of the bank or the organization 
on the other side of the house, like, hey, we want to hire you? Or was it just they blew it, like they were lazy and the money was too good and it was easier to slap a triple A than to do the work and say, actually, it's triple B and now your Chinese investor has to get more money for it, has to get a better interest rate? You know, it's probably a combination of the two, but I think that um, they had a duty to their customers to, you know, be able to rate these things properly and they did not. So I would say that it was... Um, It wasn't an accident. They weren't doing the work necessary to really understand them. Their models were completely flawed. And they have, too, bought into the idea that real estate prices never go down. So it was, um, you know, sins of omission and commission, definitely. We'll get back to our interview with Gretchen Morganson about the financial crisis in just a minute. Hey, during the break, hop onto our website, jillonmoney.com, and click on that tab that's called Book. And you can pre-order my book, The Dumb Things Smart People Do With Their Money. When we return, more of our interview. We'll be right back. Back to Jill on Money, where Jill Schlesinger helps you take the mystery out of your finances. You're back with Jill on Money, and we are talking about the 10-year anniversary of the financial crisis. It really was the sort of the heat of it was taking place 10 years ago, September, for the month of September, October, even, you know... December, there are all different things that were going on. But uh, anyway, I didn't realize this, that actually it was uh, it was in December when the they, the Treasury authorized lending money for the car companies from the TARP funds. But anyway, uh, we are here and lucky to have an expert. We have Gretchen Morganson, a fantastic journalist who's currently at The Wall Street Journal, She's here to help us unravel the entire financial crisis in just one show. Well, come on, you know, we, you can't do it in one show, but you, you know, look, this is a good primer if you've forgotten. And one of the big problems with the crisis is how the world was totally interconnected in ways that many of us did not realize. So here is more of our interview with Gretchen Morganson. How do you see this in retrospect? You know, it was it felt like a U.S. crisis, but it was happening internationally. So what was your understanding at the time of either how the European banks were playing in this or how the Asian influence of, hey, interest rates are so low, we have all these dollars, we need to buy U.S. dollar denominated Mm -hmm. assets. What was your understanding at that time? And what's your understanding today of like the international piece of this? Well, it was truly an international problem. And we had exported our garbage, our mortgage garbage all around the world. So the 2007 summer moment where things start to freeze up, it really started in the UK. So um, there was a bank failure in the UK. And so you you could see that was a canary in the coal mine. Um, And, you know, we had really done a disservice to these banks Mm. around the world. Or they had messed up by not looking themselves, right? Both. There's enough blame to go around. But anyway, so we were selling this stuff to them and they were buying it by the truckload. So, you know, yes, there was an enormous amount of pain, particularly German banks. Um, You know, uh, Iceland, of course, the entire banking world went bankrupt in Iceland. So, you know, it was it was an international problem. When you recount a lot of the stories in the book, you start with the government sponsored entities yep. of Fannie and mm-hmm, Freddie. Mm-hmm. So can you explain a little bit about how that becomes the the germ of this contagion? Well, Fannie and Freddie for many, many, many years, Fannie was created, you know, what, in the 30s um, to help kind of ease the pain of the depression and help home ownership, help people borrow money to buy a home. And they had operated very, very kind of conservatively and well for decades. But they, too, got ramped up and and whipped up into the frenzy over reaching for mortgages. So when home ownership reached a certain level, 67 percent or something like that, it became, uh, you know, there was a drive in the United States to increase the level of home ownership. But what was not 
not realized or or what people want, didn't want to realize was that that would mean going down the risk or up the risk level, down the credit level. So you would have to reach, you would have to allow a person to get a mortgage who was maybe not as able to pay it back as a person was, you know, traditionally. Mm-hmm. So they reached, they went for that extra push in addition to what the banks were doing. So, and Fannie and Freddie, as you know, um, buy mortgages from the lenders. They don't make the mortgages themselves. Right. They're not saying, hey, Gretchen, you've got a 400, a credit score of 400, here's the money. Right. And when they made home ownership as this, you know, nirvana on high, mm-hmm. they there was also a political part of it, which is a, and a lobbying effort, which was, hey, you know what? The mortgage industry is shutting out people of color, uh, people who can't get a mortgage. And there's a, almost like a racist component to it. Right. How did that play into this? Very big, very big role. And of course, the companies at that point, were, uh, they were privately held. They had shareholders. Um, their, their executives were making enormous amounts of money, even though they were quasi-government agencies. So you had this kind of disconnect between what their real role was supposed to be as Congress intended it, which was to facilitate home ownership, but not to make it riskier. Mm -hmm. and what they were actually doing, which was really based on uh, growing their earnings. And the executives, of course, when the earnings would rise, would get enormous packages based on the performance of the companies. So it was a conflict, an inherent conflict within the operations of these companies. And so you talk about, uh, who's the guy in the 90s? Johnson? Jim Johnson. You really don't like him. You don't like him. I don't know. Like, like, (laughs) dislike, like, no. Uh, You know, this was a guy who was a real political animal, and he would not let anybody anybody raise a question about whether what they were doing was the right thing. He would brook none of that. And he made a fortune, a fortune, and laying the groundwork for what then ultimately became a real disaster for the companies. So talk about what happened when the government had, like at the at the seismic moment, what was, what was the recognition among the administration officials at the time about Fannie? That the company had been allowed to be too aggressive, um, take too much risk, because it was essentially underwritten by the government. It's not a government entity. No. But it has... A it's halo. Backed. It's backed by the right. supposedly the full faith of Correct. the U.S. government. Correct. It's what backed. does that mean? Well, that means that if there's a default, if there's a loss, that the government steps in and covers it. And that is, in fact, what happened. So the companies were taking far too many risks. They also were building up their balance sheets, owning the mortgages when they really were supposed to have simply been packaging them. Um, And, you know, selling those securities. So it was a combination of things, but it was essentially they had taken on too much risk, risky mortgages, and they were held on the balance sheet instead of packaging and being sold to investors. So this was um, really kind of the moment when we understood that the government was on the hook for for this. Now, nowadays, they're completely different. They can't lobby. Mm -hmm. Uh, They are very profitable. Mm -hmm. They don't hold mortgages on their balance sheets anymore. Uh, So they have completely been reined back into where their... Uh, where Congress really wanted them to be all along. It was just they got out of control. Is there a case to be made that that Fannie should have been dismantled? Or... Is Fannie what it should be, yes. and it works well? Yes, under I would my say friend that. Tim Myopoulos. I would say that. <laughs> you know, this is a these are entities that facilitate eighty, ninety percent of the mortgage market. So if you take them away, you're going to have an enormous a cost increase in getting a mortgage, and you're just not going to have liquidity in that market, and you need it. It's a five and a half trillion dollar market, so you don't want to take away. But they're not taking risks like they used to, and so the losses are just not there. So. I would say yes. Okay, it's... so it's, we've got it. We've got it right sized. Now let's go to the other side. Let's go to the um, investment banks. What has has occurred since the financial crisis? Ten years later, is that these bank holding companies, these systemically important financial institutions, have to have a lot more money on their balance sheets? Should I feel protected about that? Is there some crisis looming that I should be freaked out about? And you've seen it, and you should tell us all right now. <laughs> Um, This is a question I get a lot, Jill. Um, And I would say that the banks are very pretty well capitalized. Um, You don't, I think, have to worry about a systemic risk 
because of what they have on their books. Um, they, too, have become much more conservative about loans. Now, that doesn't mean that consumers aren't taking you know, um, on a lot of debt. They are. You've got a trillion four in student loan debt. You've got credit card debt. You've got car um, loan debt. So consumers are levering up. Corporations have been levering up because of the low interest rates. So we do have an expanded debt scenario. I don't see anything as seismic as the mortgage crisis coming. I do think that the banks currently are pretty well capitalized. They have been forced to build up their balance sheets and the cushion that they have. So I don't see it coming from there. But I don't have a crystal ball. So don't quote me on that or don't rely on that okay, 100%. Right, so don't don't uh, change the portfolio allocation yes, based right. on what Gretchen is saying. <laughs> Okay, we'll get back to our interview with Gretchen Morganson in just a second. If you've got a financial question or you want to share some of your foibles during the financial crisis, shoot us an email. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. We'll be right back. Do I invest here? Should I put my money there? Jill Schlesinger can help you. Back to Jill on Money. You're back with Jill on Money. I am Jill Schlesinger. Hey, you know what I forgot to announce? Big announcement. If you missed last hour, executive producer Mark Talercio is now engaged to be married. Sorry, everyone. Ladies, gentlemen, whoever found him attractive. I know everybody does. He's got that metrosexual vibe. But, uh, yeah, pulled the plug. And uh, she said yes, which was very fortunate for him. Still engaged, uh, in case his his parents are asking. (laughs) All right. uh, That's just a little good news. Before we plunge back into the bad news, which is not bad news, but it is an anniversary, the 10-year anniversary since the financial crisis. And we have a wonderful guest joining us. Uh, Her name is Gretchen Morganson. She currently is with The Wall Street Journal, previously was at The New York Times. She wrote a book about the financial crisis called Reckless Endangerment. And in this segment, what we do is we talk about how the bailout really focused on banks, not people, and how the bailout abandoned Main Street in favor of Wall Street. Here's more of our interview with Gretchen Morganson. I was also very struck by the fact that, you know, in there, all of them tell their own story, right? right? Geithner wrote a book. Did Paulson write a book? I don't know if he did write a book, but he's been interviewed. Mm-hmm. Um, and Bernanke's written a book, and it, it's this, you know, like we came in and we rescued everything. Right. right. But they really screwed homeowners. Yes. And I'm not saying the crazy house flippers; they should have lost. Yeah. The right, regular right. people who were underwater, the the two administrations. The outgoing Bush, the incoming Obama, they just really let the people hang out to dry. Completely agree. So the reaction, the response to Wall Street was, oh, my gosh, let's fix this. Hurry, hurry. We have to throw trillions of dollars at this problem. The response to Main Street was pound sand. Yeah, like harp. Remember harp? Yeah. Harp versions when two, seven, eight, twelve, and you, no one could get any right. help. It was insane. I'll never forget the New York Times. We were trying to get numbers from the Treasury about HAMP or HARP, one of those things. And we were just having a devil of a time getting any response from them about how many mortgages had been saved. Okay, And it turned out was because there were none. And it was a completely inefficient or ineffectual mechanism. And so, but they just wouldn't tell us. And so after a while, we just figured, okay, this is really now becoming a story that we can't get this simple data out of Mm -hmm. this entity. But anyway, so yeah, the response to Main Street was, I think, it was wrong. It was, it was meaningless. It was, it ended up helping very few people. Even the settlements, the huge billion dollar settlements with the banks, ended up helping very few homeowners, Yeah, very few. And I think, Jill, that that helped lay the groundwork for the um, appeal that Donald Trump had in 2016 when he would talk about the game being rigged. 
yeah, I agree with you. I think that that's the that's they sowed the seeds of that discontent that like, wow, fat cat bankers can get bailed right. out. The other part of it was even at that point where if you really, truly believe and I'm sure that Bernanke did believe this, that uh, if we if the system goes under, the system goes under mm-hmm. and that's bad for right. everyone. Why didn't they strike more significant deals with the banks and say, you know what, Jamie Dimon, I'm calling BS on you not needing it. That's baloney because if everyone else fails, you're going down. Right. But the deals that they struck were actually pretty tame relative to like what happened? There was no upside for the government even. No. There A, there were no strings attached. Like Oh, we so got paid say, interest. Right. But they would say, you know, how about saying, okay, we're gonna give you this money, but you have to make X number of loans to struggling homeowners or you have to Forgive X number of mortgages for people who are underwater. None of that. And even the interest rate that we earned, the taxpayer earned on that, was was way below what it would should have been had we charged a market rate of interest. Yeah, distressed debt. Right, right, right. Um, Are there any banks that that you think are um, today still teetering on insolvency, or is everybody still is everyone okay? Um, I think that in this country, the capital requirements have really pretty much um, made everybody, you know, money good. So Mm -hmm. I'm not too worried. I mean, I think there are some, you know, European banks that really haven't dealt with the problems. But I'd say in this country, I think you're pretty much on solid ground. Ten years later, what did you get wrong the first pass? What did you think? What did you not quite grasp in the moment? I guess I didn't maybe understand how big and far-reaching this was and how many tentacles, where the tentacles lay, um, and inter- the interconnectedness of it all, you know, really, I guess, surprised me. I, too, am surprised, you know, I I really, I guess my the thing that I really got wrong was that I thought that a crisis of this size and magnitude would result in people going to jail. Ah. Boy, did I get that wrong. So who went to jail? Uh, fabulous Fab Touré of Goldman Sachs. He was indicted. I don't think he went he? to jail. I'm not sure if he went to jail, but there was one guy who went to jail who was, um, what was his name? He was the CEO of a mortgage lender, but it was, you know, not a household name. Um, Mozilla from Countrywide? He did not go to jail, no. Frank Rains? No. no. And they, they lied about what they were doing, essentially, right? Well, Countrywide, here you have a guy who was, you know, selling stock in Countrywide. He, you know, had these programs like a lot of executives do where they automatically sell every quarter or whatever. He was selling while he was writing emails to his lieutenants saying, these are toxic loans. We're going to get in trouble selling these loans. Or should we be doing these loans? It's poison. These were actual emails that the SEC came up with when they tried to get him on insider trading. He sold $500 million worth of stock while he was writing emails about how toxic the company's loans were. Now, I don't know why that guy is walking around. Mm. So in the SNL crisis of the late 80s, early 90s, there were hundreds of people went to jail for a much smaller problem that did not have an impact of the size of this crisis. So it can be done. It was done. And it sent a message to people. This time around, nobody went to jail except for this one person at this mortgage lender of any high level. And the message is clear. Do it again next time and do it in bigger size. Well, thanks so much to Gretchen Morganson. You should go check her out because she's written so many fabulous things uh, at the Wall Street Journal, at the New York Times. And if you've got some more time, hop onto our website, jillonmoney.com. And while you're there, sign up for our free weekly newsletter. We'll be right back. Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, she's all over the place. Go to JillOnMoney.com to find it all. Now back to the show with Jill Schlesinger. You're back with Jill on Money. If you've got a financial question, we'd love to hear from you. So easy. Just send us an email. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. 
You can do that any time. That is what uh, Lula did. She says, her sister in Minneapolis turned me on to you. I love that. Uh, I'm, I'm in California. I'm 65 years old. I've been retired for five years. I'm single. Well, her hus- she's a, a widow. Her husband died. I need to figure out what to do with $175,000. It's in a traditional IRA at Charles Schwab. I am extremely conservative. I don't like the stock market. Okay. Good to know that about yourself. I currently draw $1,000 a month from the 175. That makes it a little bit harder, right? Because you're drawing money from this and you're drawing at a pretty good clip. Right now, the money's sitting in a money market. It's not growing. I looked in an annuity. No, don't do an annuity. Ah, I have another $150,000 in a real estate company that offers me about a 5 to a 9% return on my money. I've got a $600,000 home with a reverse mortgage. I collect Social Security. I live on about $3,300 a month to give you the total picture. When I become 70, I will switch from my deceased husband's Social Security and I will collect on my fully... Uh, on my full Social Security benefit, it'll give me $700 more a month. What's your advice? You know what my advice is? You need a financial advisor. You really do. Okay, I, you get enticed when you say a real estate investment company will provide you with 5 to 9% return on your money. Do you think that that increase in interest comes at no cost? It does. And that cost is what? It's risk. Because they can pay you 5 to 9% return, but you can also see the value fluctuate dramatically. What may be the option is that you need someone to take a look at your big picture and come up with a strategy that's going to help you pull that $1,000 a month without blowing through all your money. And you can find an advisor by going to a couple different sources. You can go to the CFP website, letsmakeaplan.org. You can go to the National Association of Personal Financial Advisors or NAPFA.org. You could talk to maybe uh, if you work with an accountant, find out whether the accountant knows any CPAs who have the personal financial specialist designation. This is not a simple answer. This is a bigger, I think, a bigger question. Okay. Okay. Here is Janice who is married 67 and 70 years old, retired government pension. Only debt is a $240,000 mortgage balance on a $480,000 home. My friend suggested a reverse mortgage so we can, quote, use our equity and, quote, save the value of the home. I say it's a lifetime mortgage and we have to put down a large closing cost. We have disposable income each month, so no need for additional cash. What are your thoughts? Don't do it. Come on. You already know this. I can tell you know this. The reason why you have a reverse mortgage is because you need cash flow. You don't need cash flow. So that is incredibly important. You don't do it just for the heck of it. The note has to get paid off one way or the other. You don't need cash flow. Don't do this. Do not do this. Wayne writes, uh, when I, and when he retires at the end of the year, he can get a $730,000 lump sum or $4,200 a month for life. I will be 64 and in great health. No children. I need to know what else is going on. Do you have other money? Is this the only money you have? Um, If you're in great health, generally speaking, uh, uh, having a monthly $4,200 a month uh, might do it. If that's all the money that you have in the world, I might not do it because maybe you want to have some liquidity. Um, Do you have a spouse? I'm thinking no because you didn't mention a spouse. Uh, I need more info. Aren't I pain in the neck, Mark, with all this demand, demand, demand? More info, more info. Oh, gosh. Uh, This is in highlighted in green, but I'm going to read it because Mark says I should do it. Dear Miss Schlesinger, Ms. Uh, Whenever someone's, by the way, someone called me recently Mrs. Schlesinger, and I'm like, "Mm, Mrs. Schlesinger, that's my mother. I'm Jill. Uh, So this is from Stephanie, who looks forward to reading my column in the Chicago Tribune uh, when they devote the business section to personal finance. Um, For your information, you're the first column on the first page. Nice. 
My question is about annuities. I'm retired, and there are many articles about how to withdraw your money in a tax-efficient way. I can't find any advice on when or how to withdraw from your annuity. I know there are at least two ways to take your withdrawal. An article and your advice about annuities would be much appreciated. Uh, Well, usually, I I, I always write articles on annuities, but um, usually once a year. So let me see when I – maybe I'll do that sooner rather than later. Um, What you should know is that there aren't usually two ways to get your money out of an annuity. There are many ways. So you can either look at a lump sum, which can roll into – once you've done with all the fees, maybe it just rolls into another – Retirement account, a direct rollover, if it's a retirement account. If it's a non-retirement annuity, you can take a lump sum, but there'll be taxes due. You could get a monthly stream of income. And then there are all different permutations about how that monthly stream could come. It could come you and half go to your spouse. It can come to you for a certain period of time. It could come to you for your lifetime. So what I would need to know is a little bit more about the annuity And uh, if you want, uh, maybe Mark will get you on the show because I have many more questions for you. All right. You're listening to Jill on Money. And if you've got a financial question, we'd love to hear from you. Our email address is askjill at jillonmoney.com. We will be right back. You're back with Jill on Money. This is the program that takes the mystery out of your financial life, but only if you allow us to help you out. And one way to do that is to just hop onto the website, jillonmoney.com, click on the Contact Us button. You don't even have to remember an email address then. Isn't that easy? Okay, but if you really do want the email address, it's askjill at jillonmoney.com. Before we finish up, the show, we've got an email from someone who says that uh, I was diagnosed with, I don't like to say the name when it's like a diagnosis. I was diagnosed with chronic myeloid leukemia in 2008, and I will celebrate being in remission for 10 years. That's amazing, right? I work in finance. I've got a family. I, of course, uh, and do not look or act like a cancer patient. That's funny. Uh I can't get additional life insurance because companies are afraid to even even touch me, even though many people like me take chemo every day, but they don't have cancer. Okay. This is a problem. This is like the quintessential pre-existing condition. And, you know, I'm not sure if this is, I don't know if you've tried lately. Let me just say that because I remember during the, you know, many early years of the AIDS crisis that no insurance company would underwrite a person who had HIV or was HIV positive, even though they weren't in like full-blown AIDS. And then that started to change as there was more information. So first of all, um, maybe I would say, do you, have you done this recently? Have you looked to try to get coverage recently? Because there are some companies that do um, specialize in harder to place insurance policies. So that's number one. Um, number two, let's say that you can't do that. Here's the, um, I have $100,000 in life insurance, um, $188,000 annuity that provides a death benefit, $80,000 in Roth IRAs. I just turned 50. I started a new job. Uh, what financial products should I look at to care for my teenage boys? You should save like crazy because if you can't get life insurance, I think anything else is going to be kind of paying for something you don't need. So I just think save, save, save. And check out those insurers that do tend to specialize in harder to place cases. Um, I'm sorry about that. And I wish you the best of luck. You all are fabulous. Thank you so much for listening today. And we'll see you next week. If you missed any part of the show, go to JillOnMoney.com. Mark likes to post the show after the fact. So give us a couple hours and we'll see you next week. Take care.